Hey everybody. I'm really excited to do another Q&A today because um, I've got a lot to talk about with what I've been up to lately. And it was just time to do another one of these. Um, so I'm gonna wait a second, let some more people get here. Please get comfortable in the chat, say hi, whatever, since I'm gonna be taking all your questions. Um, let me know if anything sounds weird with the audio or there's any issues like that. And I am gonna really try to keep an eye on the chat here. But last time I did a Q and A, um, we didn't have a lot of questions until the stream had been going for a while, which I think is sort of normal. People take a while to get comfortable. It takes people a while to get here or whatever. They're doing something else. So I do have my cello and I figured I could like practice a little bit to kill the time if people don't have questions. Um, Cause I know people like the practice streams too. Um, but I really just wanted to do a Q and A video because I just like, I get so many questions in DMs, the comments, everything, and it's really hard for me to answer all of them all the time. So doing these gives me an opportunity for the people who really want an answer to something, uh, gives them a chance to actually ask me directly in real time. Hey guys, hello, welcome. Um, if you are liking the stream, give it a thumbs up at any point. You don't have to do it now if you're not, <laughs> you're not sure if you like the stream yet. Um, I'm just gonna finish getting all set up here. And then I'll talk a little bit about what I've been up to in case you missed it, and then um, we'll get into questions. So, how am I gonna do this? Keep, I gotta keep the chat in my view. I'm doing this all on one computer. You know, sometimes when I do the practice streams, I have a separate laptop. I have the one that's doing the stream, and then I have one near my cello, but I'm just doing it all on one computer today. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't expect you to stay up till 3 a.m., but I hope you have a great lesson in the morning. And yes, the stream will be archived, so you can always come back to it. But thanks for stopping by so late at night. Okay. So, what have I been up to lately, in case you missed it? Well, the main thing was that I released my album, Old Friends, which I worked on over the summer. It was still a very quick project, though. Um, we recorded in mid to late June and then um, spend about a month or two me doing the editing and mixing and then my brother doing the mastering and then we really threw everything together pretty fast you know we, we put together a whole album in three months time or something like that um, but the product I'm so happy with um, my friend Laura Rubenstein Salzedo who played with me is my favorite Baroque violinist ever. She is just the best. And I think if you haven't heard the album, you will love her playing. I have copies of the CD here, but they're shrink wrapped. And so the glare, cause I've got a lot of natural light in here right now. Can't really see much with the glare. Let's see if I can get it. So the physical CDs were only for uh, fundraiser backers because we're really pushing it as a digital album. Um, and so you probably heard about the album, but if you haven't, it's three Baroque violin sonatas played just on cello and violin. Um, so it has really like a duet feel to the album, even though they are violin sonatas, the cello is playing the continual part, AKA the bass line. So, and we picked sonatas that had a lot of interplay between the continual part and the solo part. So it really does have a duet feel to the album, which is really nice. Um, and I'm of course playing on my Baroque cello, Laura is playing on her Baroque violin, gut strings, all of that. So our goal is really to get more people hearing uh, what these early instruments sound like. And the repertoire we're playing, um, it's not too obscure. We're doing sonatas by Vivaldi, Handel, and then Corelli was our 17th century choice. We both love Corelli, so we knew we had to do a Corelli sonata. But the Handel and Vivaldi were sort of because everyone loves those composers, the music is really accessible, um, and we just wanted this album to be something that anybody could listen to. Like, you don't have to be a seasoned classical music, early music, Baroque music person to put this album on and just enjoy it. Um, so Old Friends is now out everywhere. Um, the link that I've been directing everyone to, and there's a bunch of links in the description of this video for anything that I talk about today, but fanlink to slash old friends is the link to get the album and you can get it on Spotify, uh, iTunes, Google Play, wherever you want to get it. And I actually have all the tracks uploaded on YouTube as well. The actual audio from the CD is on my channel on the old friends playlist. So give the album a listen if you haven't yet. We're so happy with how it came out. We are just like thrilled. Um, so definitely listen to it. I'd love to know what you guys think if you haven't heard it yet. I know a lot of you have already listened to it and given me really, really awesome uh, your feedback and response seems like everyone's been loving it. So I, I'm so happy about that. 
let's see. Oh, I already moved, so I can't see the chat. <laughs> let's see. Um, uh, okay. Bufar thinks I should play a little bit um, before people have questions. Okay. Um, what am I going to play? Scales? I still want to talk about my tutorial, but maybe I'll, since you guys want to hear me play, maybe I'll play a little bit and then, um, and then I'll talk about the tutorial that I put out and let some more people get here and so on. What am I going to play today? I taught a lesson today uh, with a student who is working on uh, one of the Capriccio by Dallabaco, which I recorded on my Bass Sounds Evolved album. So I've been kind of in the mode of those pieces. Um, we've also been working on a Gemignani Sonata together, which has been nice. But honestly, I could just play some scales. That would be the best thing for me. Um, but yeah, let, let's, I'll play a little something or I can play some Bach. There's a lot of stuff I can do. But what? Maybe I'll just play some Bach. That's like the most accessible, crowd-pleasing thing I could do, right? All right. And am I in the mood to read off of the manuscript? Mm, not really today. Not in the mood. <laughs> Might use my modern print copy. Because I didn't really have anything prepared to play today, so I'm going to make it easy on myself. Hopefully the cello audio sounds okay and is not... I'm going to turn the volume down just a little bit, but you guys can let me know if it suddenly sounds terrible. tuner I love. It's in my Amazon shop. I recommend it. It's not really a tuner. It's a metronome that plays drones, but I use it to tune too. slipping. The peg has been slipping. Okay. Oh, is it smoke? So it's, this is um, an essential oil diffuser. It's mostly water. It's basically a humidifier, but it's made to put essential oils in. Um, but then I found out essential oils are not healthy for cats, so I don't use it as much anymore for the sake of my cat Daisy. Um, they're not like toxic toxic, but they're not something the cat should be exposed to like a lot because um, their livers can't detoxify certain compounds. Anyway, um, so now I just use it as a humidifier. It's been really dry like the last day or so in LA, so I'm just running it for moisture for my gut strings. Um, okay, and guys, for, in terms of questions, if you think of questions while I'm playing right now, Throw them in the chat. Once I'm done playing a movement of Bach or something, I will check in with all the questions. So don't hold back. Okay. I think I'll play the Allemande of the from the first Bach cello suite. That's one of my go-tos. I don't know if I'm gonna play the second half or just the first half. I'll see how I'm feeling once we get going. And you guys know on the live streams, you always get the raw, like I didn't warm up or practice or do anything yet. So um, this is just what comes out.
to me. I know you'll tolerate a couple bumps here and there. I'm going to actually put my jello back over here. Oops. Have you noticed how many times I slam my bow into things? All right, I turned my volume back up now that I'm talking. <laughs> okay. Back to the chat. I should stop cutting my head off. Um, yes, the sheet music is very intense. Where did it go? I'll show it again. So, there we go. Doing a bad job managing looking at the chat and doing this. Okay. Yeah, so this is the closest thing we have to a manuscript for the Bach cello suites. I feel like I show this on every live stream, but it's just a good thing for people to see because we're all so familiar with the Bach cello suites. This copy was, uh, written or copied down by one of his wives. It was his only wife at the time, but Bach had a number of them. Anna Magdalena was his wife who was his copyist who wrote down uh, the suites in the earliest version that we have of them. We don't have a copy that Bach himself wrote. But anyway, she was sloppy. The copy is like the, the ink is smeared, but then she in general was just sloppy. So it's a, it's a tough manuscript to play from. I have done it. I've performed suites off of this, but I've learned them first on modern print and then performed off of this. I think trying to learn a suite on this is like kind of unnecessarily difficult. Um, have I ever dropped my cello? Well, in order to like drop it, drop it, I'd have to have like lifted it up into the air. So I haven't done that, but like knocking the cello over, I don't do that so much anymore. But when I was younger, my modern cello, I definitely knocked that over. Like when you have the cello sitting on the side, um, like you would when you're practicing and you just set it down on its side, definitely knocked it over a couple times. I think I just slammed my bow into stuff more than I actually dropped my cello. I think one time, again, this was all my modern cello. It was when I was a little younger. I think I had my cello standing upright in its case and it once fell over. <laughs> but it was fine. The case did its job, thankfully. Um... Okay, when did I begin playing the cello? I answered this a lot. So I started actually just learning the cello in the fourth grade in my public school. So I was eight years old in fourth grade. I was young for my grade. Um, so I was like about eight or nine and I was just learning in public school. So like once a week I would go to a group class. So I was barely learning anything is what I'm getting at. I was I like just learning the bare minimum of how to play notes. And I continued playing in orchestra at school from fourth grade through middle school, and it was just like an activity that I did. I never practiced, I, I didn't really think anything of it. It was just like one of the things I did at school was play the cello in orchestra once a week. Um, but then when I was in 10th grade, so I was 14 going on 15, 
Um, we got a new orchestra teacher at our high school who was like really gung ho, wanted to revamp the whole program. And she really encouraged everybody to take private lessons, which I didn't even know was a thing at that time. Um, and so I started taking private lessons when I was 14. And then I was like, oh, wow, I'm super into this. Like it wasn't the same experience as playing at school in a group. It was just like, I wasn't that connected to it. But once I had one-on-one -on -one instruction, I was like, oh, I'm so into this. So I really don't feel like I started the cello until I was about 14 or 15 because I, you know, it was just like an activity. But technically I have been playing the cello um, since I was about eight or nine. So 20 years, <laughs> I've been playing the cello for 20 years. Um, you know, many people start string instruments at three, four, five years old with a private teacher at that age. Um, that's what's much more common for classical music to be playing in school casually like I did and not start lessons until high school is way more uncommon for people who are now professionals in the field. Most people who are professionals started younger and more seriously than I did. Um, what's my personal opinion on becoming a full-time professional musician? Can you be a little more specific? I don't know my opinion on what exactly. I'm not totally sure what you're asking. Uh, general comments, I could say it's difficult, um, but music school is really difficult too. I mean, I think you learn pretty fast if you go into music and you go to music school that music is just not an easy path at all. Um, and music school shows you that and then getting out of music school shows you that. Um, but just like anything, it just takes determination and focus and it takes being self-directed because there are no clear cut career paths um, for musicians for the most part, with the exception of orchestra jobs, which are extremely small percentage of the work that's available, very competitive, very hard to get, and actually have very low job satisfaction, um, orchestral musicians. So you have to be willing to make your own way and sort of figure out how you're going to make it work. And you also have to be okay with the fluctuations of sometimes you have a lot of work, sometimes you have no work, which means a decent amount of money or no money. So there's a lot of fluctuations and instability, but you know, you, you can make it work and the more creative and innovative you are, the better um, in terms of putting your career together. Um, tips on playing Vivaldi stylistically. Certain way to play Vivaldi or is it up to you to choose how to play it? Well, technically everything is up to you to choose how you play it. Um, Vivaldi is a Baroque composer, so like all the stuff about playing Baroque music stylistically applies to Vivaldi. Um, I think if I had to give some quick, you know, I have so many videos on my channel um, in the instructional videos playlist that talk about some of the basic fundamentals of how to play Baroque music in a stylistic way, you know, giving you a couple bullet points of how to get started. Um, but I think the big one is being aware of where the harmony changes, um, like, and a lot of times you can see it in the bass line or if it's a piano part or whatever, but seeing on which beats are there new harmonies, like a new chord, and understanding that that is your framework for the piece. I think what a lot of modern players do when they play, especially Vivaldi has so many notes, like always all these 16 note passages, they try to make all those notes of equal value. This note, this note, this note, this note. And really Baroque music is much more about the harmony than it is about every single note. Um, so knowing that, okay, I may have a whole measure of 16th notes, but the harmony is only changing on beat one and beat three. So you don't need to overemphasize the second beat and the fourth beat, which are just reiterating the harmonies of the beat that came before. You wait for a harmony change to give more emphasis. Um, just not overemphasizing every single thing. Um, playing around with the idea of strong and weak, which is another concept I've talked about. So like make your down bows stronger than your up bows. We have a tendency in modern playing to like pump our up bows and make them equal to the down bows, but that's actually not what they did in the Baroque period. You can see it from my Baroque bow my modern bows in the case, sorry, um, that the tip is the tip is light. So that means you play a down bow, you've got the meat of the bow here to get a nice down bow, but then you go up bow, you don't have as much weight, uh, you don't have as much tension. So naturally the up bows are gonna be lighter. Um, and you can simulate that on your modern bow, even if it's not constructed like this, you can play lighter on the up bows, which a modern teacher might say, oh, make your up bows stronger. But actually uh, during the time their up bows were lighter and that'll automatically give you a little bit of like strong, weak emphasis in your, um, in your piece. So I would start with that stronger down bows, weaker up bows, experiment with that. Listen for harmony changes. Don't make every note have the same emphasis. Um, 
So why do you hold your bow in the middle? I'm not exactly holding it in the middle, but I am holding it up from the frog. That's because this is a Baroque bow and the cello I'm playing on is a Baroque cello. So um, there were just a lot of things different 350 years ago in how string instruments were built and how they were played. And I'm playing closer to what like Bach himself was working with when he was composing. Um, so the weight of this bow is different because it's a Baroque bow. Like I was saying before, it's got a lighter tip. It has a different shape to the stick. So you can actually see, especially if I tighten it, that the stick of the bow is curving away from the hair, whereas a modern bow, the stick would be curving in. And I know it looks like people who don't know what my bow is think I'm playing on a bass bow. They think my bow is broken. They think I tightened my bow so much that I made the wood curve the wrong way, which is really a funny thought to me. Um, but no, this bow is made to be like this. Um, and so because of a higher balance point and a lighter tip, uh, we hold the bow up a little higher and I play pinky on top, like a violin bow hold. Um, cause in the Baroque period, they actually had kind of one basic overhand bow hold. And then there was actually underhand bowing, uh, for viola da gamba and instruments like that. But the overhand bowing, uh, and bow hold was the same across violin, viola, cello, and bass instruments that were playing with overhand. So yes, I hold it up a little bit higher because it's a different bow. Um, what do you think about cellists playing popular music? For example, two cellos. Totally cool by me. What I like about that kind of thing is it exposes more people to the cello, like people who might not have ever even heard the cello or thought about the cello. They're looking up whatever song that two cellos cover and they come across that and they get exposed uh, to it. So I think it's great. Um, it's not my cup of tea personally, um, especially being a music historian and all that stuff. Like I'm interested more in the repertoire itself than I am just in the cello on principle. I'm interested in Baroque music. So that's why I play on a Baroque cello. So I, that's why I don't do stuff like two cellos is that I'm not actually interested in playing that kind of music on my cello. There's so much great music to play on my cello that's in the classical realm, which is more my thing. Um, but I think it's great that people do it. I think it's great that people watch it. Um, so that's how I feel. Um, okay. So now, uh, since I tore through those questions really fast, um, I mentioned my album at the beginning of the stream. If you're just tuning in, hi, welcome. I was just playing some Bach to pass time while people thought of questions or whatever. Um, but my new album, which is, you're not gonna be able to see because of the glare, Old Friends. There you go. You can kind of see it. Um, my duo album with my friend Laura is now out everywhere. It's three Baroque violin sonatas on period instruments, Bach, not Bach, sorry, Vivaldi, Handel, and Corelli. And it's everywhere digitally. Um, there's a link to it in the description of this video. You can also just look up Old Friends Baroque in Spotify, or you can also just look up Emily Davidson in Spotify. It's there too. Um, or just search Old Friends Baroque, Emily Davidson. However you want to find it, you will find it. <laughs> Give it a listen. Um, that came out at the end of September. And then... Um, my new garage band tutorial is now live, which I'm really excited to talk about. So I'm just gonna go off about this. But again, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. I'm gonna get to all of them. Um, so this garage band tutorial was a long time in the making. A lot of people expressed interest in it. Basically all the videos on my YouTube channel that are music performance videos. So either me playing cello or someone else playing with me, not any of the like streams or uh, talking videos, but the ones that are any kind of music. I have been doing all the audio mixing for those videos in GarageBand for years. Um, I actually learned to do it in GarageBand a ton of years ago before I knew more about audio mixing, just because it was easy. But I got really good results and people would even comment, how do you get your videos to sound so good and um, stuff like that. And it's actually really simple to do in GarageBand and many people have the software since it comes free with Macs. So I finally decided to release a tutorial where I show people what I do to mix the audio in GarageBand because so many people, they get a recording device or they record on their phone, whether it's their own concert or them playing at home, and they don't know how to make it sound good. There's no reverb on it. It just sounds like dry and bad. And then they feel bad about their playing and then they don't want to show people and it's this whole negative cycle. So being able to mix your own audio means that you can make it sound good the way an engineer would make it sound good. And then you can feel better about your playing. You can put it out there. Like there's just so many opportunities when you learn how to make your own recording sound good. Um, 
and I wanted to make it really, really easy for people who've never done this kind of thing before. Um, so I put out this tutorial that basically shows everything that I do um, on my on my videos, and I also just talk about the bare bones basic stuff, like when you drag your you know, your file that you recorded into GarageBand. How do you trim the ends off so there's no dead space? If you have two different takes, how do you splice between those two different takes? Um, you know, stuff like that. So it's super beginner friendly. I'm really happy with how it came out. It's a 40 minute video. So it's basically like getting a lesson or a private lesson. Like you sit there for 40 minutes. By the time you're done, you know a lot of stuff. Um, so that tutorial is now available. You can buy it on my website. It's just 12 bucks. I know it's like, oh, $12, but like you're gonna gain so much info. It'll be useful forever. It's gonna be the most valuable $12 you spent if you record yourself. Um, so emilyplayscello.com slash tutorials, or if you just go to my website and click on tutorials, you'll get there. Also a link in the description of the video, but check it out. Um, I'm just, I'm really excited about it. A lot of people said they wanted it. I think it's going to be just really useful for people because as far as I know, there's not something out there like that, especially geared towards classical musicians who are using their own recordings of their own violin playing or whatever. Um, so definitely check that out if you record yourself and you want to be able to just make it sound good. Um, okay, a follow-up question. Would you recommend entering music school uh, and make music the entire career focus? I'm asking because most people I know who graduate music school are actually not doing music or not full-time and they have something else and music is just on the side. Yeah, so this is a big topic. Um, I know, I went to music school for my bachelor's and then I did my master's. So I was in conservatory for six years total. And, you know, saw a lot of people who are of all different difficulty levels and, of course, sort of keep an eye on where people end up once music school is done. Um, do you guys hear that? Someone set off their smoke detector. I don't know if you guys can hear it or not. I can hear it. Um, so it's so distracting to me. We needed something, right? It's not construction today. Today it's just someone burning their dinner. Um, so... I think um, it's kind of what I was saying earlier when I was answering your question that you need a lot of creativity and a lot of drive to make a music career work because no one's going to hand you anything and you have to be willing to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to think outside of the box. Just a lot of things that people don't want to do or you have to be willing to really, really work and take a lot of auditions. It's a combo of both. Um, and you also... If you enjoy teaching or you have teaching experience, that really works. Almost every classical performer supplements with teaching, private lessons. Um, very few people make their living just on performance income alone. So if you teach, that's a good asset as well. Um, I think it's really personal for everybody uh, what your ultimate goals are. I, I do. I'm going to be honest. The classical music field as a professional is not the greatest field to go into, you know, there you're, you're working against a lot of like kind of old patterns, the way the career set up, you know, like the way basically our teachers, people in the older generation, the way they got jobs and were successful in their careers is not the same as the way the world is today. So we can't even really follow the models of our teachers because the world is so different now. So I personally believe if you're willing to be super modern about it, and what I mean by modern is using modern technology, like most people know, like Instagram is my biggest platform. I love Instagram. And I got big on Instagram by sharing little phone videos of me playing my cello. They were not edited. They did not, I didn't think they sounded that good. They were recorded on a phone speaker. But that's how I grew my following is just by putting myself out there. YouTube's another option. Um, there are a lot of things like that. Some people get creative and like, they put together an ensemble that maybe like plays in less common venues. Uh, there, there's a lot of options of how you can kind of put your music career all together. Um, but you have to be willing to do that work and want to do that work and want to be creative and want to try things in that way. Um, if you sort of want someone to tell you what to do, so like you know what the next step is and then you do the next step, that just doesn't exist, especially once you're out of music school. So if you're someone who is not great at being self-directed, I would steer against a freelance career because you just have to be in order to survive. But um, there are a lot of ways to make it work. Um, it also depends like where you're living. Like some people, maybe they live in a more remote area and they're the only cello teacher in, you know, a hundred miles. So they get all the cello students in that area. Or maybe they're in a remote area and nobody's taking cello lessons and then they have no students. There are a lot of things like that that will affect how your career goes, you know, based on where you're living and, you know, where you're located. So 
I do think um, if you do have another interest, and I don't mean an artistic interest, I mean like a more like job market kind of interest, it's not a bad idea to sort of keep those skills in decent shape so that if you ever need to get some part-time work or something to help supplement your musical income, you have that option. But it's really hard in music school. If you're in a true conservatory track, you're not going to have time for any real serious study of any other subject if you're at a halfway decent music school because music school, especially classical music school, is so demanding. The amount of hours of practice that you're expected to do on top of your rehearsals, ensembles, actual academic classes, music theory, ear training, there's so much to do in music school. So it's not super viable to be... People have done double majors, but they're always like the insane overachievers who manage to pull that off. And they're always stressed out and overworked and probably not doing as well in their music stuff because they're managing their other classes. So it's possible if you have the work ethic for it and you don't get easily discouraged. But if you go into like a performance degree or a music education degree, you're going to be booked with music classes. So you can also kind of on the side, keep other skills sharp, whatever it is. But, you know, if you're just going into college, you don't know where you're going to be in five years. By the time you're done with your degree, you don't know how you're going to feel. So it's kind of hard to, to tell you what you should do when you're starting college based on where you're going to be after college. Uh, college is a whole exploratory experience in and of itself of figuring out what you love, what's important to you, where you want to invest, what kind of things feel rewarding to you. You know, college is about figuring that out. So I think it's hard to commit to too soon about if you should be majoring in two things. If you want to do music, do music. Just be ready to be innovative is what I would say. Um, oh, Bad Resistor, thank you so much for buying Old Friends. I hope you love it. We love it. <laughs> Me and my friend who recorded it, we love it. Um, what editing software do you use to fuse two clips of you playing uh, different parts of the same piece? Well, I edit all my videos in Adobe Premiere, which is professional video software. But some of my early, early double cello videos that I did, I actually did an iMovie because again, when I started my YouTube channel, I was just using all the free software that came with my computer. So that was like iMovie, GarageBand, and I actually never transitioned away from GarageBand. But iMovie, uh, I couldn't customize things exactly how I wanted. So I started using Adobe Premiere. But almost any video editing software will allow you to take two different video clips and put them both on the same screen. And then there's a whole process of syncing them up properly, syncing them up with the audio. That's its own thing. But you don't need a special program to do that. You just need any kind of video editing software and you'll be able to do it. And they, of course, have apps now. Like I know the Acapella app is a big one, but they have apps where you can take different videos and paste them all together, too. Um... Oh, that's too bad. So Bufar says that uh, you're now in a new orchestra and you're in the senior one, but it's not that good so you won't be able to grow. Yeah, that's a bummer. I mean, hopefully a good orchestra teacher, if there is someone who's like really above the level of everybody else, will give that student opportunities like solos or, you know, getting to be section leader and maybe helping with sectionals or just some kind of additional responsibility or additional challenge to keep you interested. So... What I would say, Bufar, if you are getting like really, really bored, you should talk to your teacher and just say, is there anything I can do to like be a little more challenged? And I'm sure the teacher will be enthusiastic that you want to do that. Because um, if you put some other stuff on your plate, you'll still be able to grow. But I know it's a bummer to be in an ensemble where people are not on your level. It just kind of, kind of sucks. Um, all right. See, what I should have done is ask for questions on Instagram, and then I would have had some things to answer when there was a lull in the live questions. Let's see. Did anybody send any? Nope. I could play another movement of Bach while you guys think about stuff. And hi to everybody who's joined in the last couple minutes, just hanging out. Don't be shy in the chat. Feel free to ask whatever. I already talked about my new album, Old Friends, and also my GarageBand audio mixing tutorial, which is on my website at emilyplacecello.com slash tutorials. And those are my big things. I've been super busy with all this stuff, you guys, as you can probably imagine, putting an album together and then promoting it and releasing it. Um, 
and then the tutorial was its own situation. I've never sold anything on my website before, so setting up how to actually sell things. Um, but I'm excited because uh, depending on the feedback I get from the GarageBand tutorial, I can offer more tutorials like that. Um, yeah, exactly what I'm what I'm saying. So um, I don't have a tutorial plan for Premiere yet. I want to wait and see. One of the reasons I wanted to do the GarageBand tutorial is that it's software that everybody has, whereas like Adobe Premiere is an expensive piece of software, and I feel like the people who are buying that probably are already you know know a little bit about video editing, whereas the GarageBand was way more just like anybody who doesn't know anything can learn how to use this, and the software is free and it's on your computer already. Um, but based on what people start asking for, I'm really going to be listening because I liked making the tutorial. It was really fun for me and now it's up there forever. So anytime someone, you know, now if people ask me, how do you make your audio sound good? I can just direct them the, to the tutorial. So I could do a similar thing with videos, uh, but I'm just not sure if I want to do it for paid software because I think that rules out a lot of people who don't have the software. Anything you are interested in recently? Would love to know more about your life. Well, my brother just got me a Nintendo Switch, which I'm really excited about. Um, I played video games as a kid growing up, up until maybe like my teen years, like the, I probably played up to like the PlayStation 1. And then I got serious about cello and I just, I kind of fell off on video games. Um, but in my adulthood, I started playing them again. I started playing the Wii U uh, years ago. Like, I love Mario games. Like, anything Nintendo, honestly, I really, really enjoy. Um, but I actually don't have a TV in this apartment, which surprises people. But I don't have a TV. I have a YouTube filming music studio, which is more important to me than a television. But And everybody watches TV on their computer anyway with, like, Hulu and Netflix. But... Um, so I didn't have a TV, so even though I actually have all my old video game consoles, I don't have them set up because I have nothing to plug them into. But my brother just got me a Nintendo Switch, which for those who don't know, it's a gaming console that you can play on a TV or you can play it as a handheld console like a Game Boy or something. Um, so because I don't have a TV, it's perfect. Um, so I've been playing that. I've been playing this indie game called Undertale, which I've played, uh, I played that when it came out, which was a couple years ago, but it's one of my favorite games. Uh, so I'm playing it again. Uh, but I think next, maybe I'll get like Mario Kart or something like that. Uh, so that's been like my decompression activity, which I'm very bad at having those, which I think is why my brother just bought it for me and said like, go chill out. You need to chill out. So that, now I have a Nintendo Switch. So that, that's, that's been the exciting, fun thing of my life. Um, since you've been busy with old friends in the GarageBand tutorial, and most likely several other things. Are you okay? I am okay. You know, I like to be busy and I like to be doing a lot of stuff. I actually am doing worse when I don't have stuff going on. Just because I have like, you know, I'm a creative person. I have a lot of ideas and a lot of inspiration and um, I like putting in the work. So it's good for me to have projects. The album was, the tutorial was a process, but not terrible. The album was a lot of work. Uh, but now I have an album, so you can't expect to record a full-length album and have it not be a lot of work. So, uh, the al by the ending stages of the album, if you asked me if I was okay, I might have not said yes because I was so exhausted. Um, I did a lot of editing work on the album, so the recording process, while that was tiring, it was like two days of me and Laura just hanging out and having fun and playing together, the editing process was a lot more, like, grueling. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just gotta do the grueling work if you want a good result, so... Uh, being busy is good. And now the album's done and the tutorial's done, so now it's like, what's next? And that's why I'm doing a live stream um, and thinking about what's next for the channel. As you guys know, I've been putting collaborators on the channel a lot because I've recorded, I've got, I don't know, 250 videos on my channel or something like that, and a lot of them are me playing my cello, which is great, but there's only so much repertoire that I can really play. So bringing collaborators on allows me to expand what kind of early music I can put on the channel. Um, so, and if you're an early music person, Baroque music, you play on a period instrument and you want to be on my channel, uh, you can go to emilyplayscello.com slash collaborators. There's a form you can fill out there, uh, to be featured. But yeah, so just kind of like expanding what the channel has to offer, um, thinking about stuff like that. Cause I've been at this YouTube channel for years, putting out videos regularly. So it's kind of like I'm at that point where I have to figure out, okay, well, what's next? You know, I've already covered a lot of the things that people ask me for are videos that I already have made. So I just direct people, yeah, I already made a video about that. So I'll have to figure out, you know, what kind of stuff makes sense to do next. Um, 
Would you ever consider being an adjunct professor at a college and teach music appreciation type classes? Absolutely. Um, I have taught college level. I was a guest artist at the University of Central Oklahoma back in 2013. Um, but that was a guest artist, like visiting artist thing. So I just flew in for a week. I did some master classes. Um, I played a recital. I did a chamber music concert with the faculty. And I loved, I loved doing that and working with college students. Um, and I, I would love to have a position like that. But I think a lot of times those positions, colleges, everything with education, there's a lot of politics involved. Like generally schools like to hire alum and I now live on the other coast from the schools that I went to. Um, so it's not super easy to get those jobs, even though I'm qualified for them. Um, but yeah, I would definitely enjoy doing something like that. Music appreciation, music history, um, stuff like that, for sure. Does pineapple go on pizza? You know, I haven't had pineapple pizza and it's so polarizing, but I'm someone who likes weird food combinations. Like I always say, like, if I like two foods separately, I'll probably like them together, except I made a mistake the other day. <laughs> this is so ridiculous. I often make like fresh guacamole as like a meal. I eat it as a meal, not alone, like with chips, but uh, I was out of cilantro, which is like an important ingredient in guacamole, but I had fresh basil and I was like, maybe I could make like basil guacamole. It was not good. You guys don't ever replace your cilantro with basil. It was terrible. Um, so I guess I don't really like every combination together, but I thought I did. Um, so pineapple on pizza, I feel like I would like it, but I've never had it, so I can't really say for sure. Um, when you record each part for a piece and put them together before editing them, do you, they usually sync up on themselves or do you need to sync them up with editing? Okay, so, and so many people ask how I do those split screen videos. Um, I am naturally syncing them up by how I play. So what I do is I record, um, usually I record the bass. Is that what I do? No, I record the solo part first. Whatever part is harder, I record that first because the more difficult part is gonna be the one where you maybe stretch the time or you need an extra second somewhere to do a technical thing. So I always record the solo part or the harder part first. Then I put the file on my phone. Like I usually have to upload it to my computer and then copy it to my phone. And then I put it on my phone and I put earbuds in and I slip an earbud in. A lot of times in the videos you can't even see it because I'll like wire it through my shirt and hide it in my hair, but I'll put an earbud in with the solo part and then I'll play the accompaniment along to the recording that I did of the solo part so that the timing is exactly right. Um, I don't use a click track or anything like that because classical music is not performed metronomically. But um, so I just listen and do it. And luckily I've been playing continuo bass line accompaniment uh, forever. So I can accompany in a lot of circumstances. I'm very used to like the way you have to kind of listen and be flexible and make the timing work. Um, so for me, it's very easy to do it that way. I don't know if I didn't have that continual experience, if it would be more difficult, but so anyway, once I record it by listening to the other part and playing along, they're already in sync. I have to drag them to be in the right spot, you know, make sure they start at the right time. But once they're starting at the right time, the timing should be correct. Okay. Maybe I should do the second half of the Alamon since I only play the first half. <laughs> We're doing like movements split with, uh, with a million, million minutes in between. Um, okay, oh, well, Bufar, I'll answer your next question before I play more. Um, do you have any tips for creating covers? Depends what you're doing a cover of and the arrangement, like arranging, which is the process of deciding which instruments you're gonna use and how you're gonna use them to do the cover is its own situation. And I actually don't love arranging. Um, I find it very tedious. I didn't, never really learned the skills, um, especially like, I guess I learned the skills in music school, but it's, it's a lot of work to like write out parts and figure out how you're gonna do whatever. Um, for the cover. So I would figure out, are you doing them on instruments? Are you going to be like making the covers electronically or there's a lot of great, especially if you're covering a song that's popular, there are so many good resources online, whether it's like sheet music, guitar chords, piano chords, YouTube videos. Like if you can't figure out the song yourself, just do some searching and you will find resources that will figure out the song for you that will help you. Um, but there's no like right or wrong way to do a cover. It's hard to speak generally, not knowing exactly how you're trying to arrange it. Um, but definitely my biggest tip is 
Google and YouTube whatever you need to figure out how to play the piece or song if you have no clue, because there's a lot of good info out there. All right, let's play some more Bach. And um, I was going to stream for about an hour, and we're at like 45 minutes or so. Um, so definitely get your questions in in the next like 15, 10, 15 minutes, because that'll be it for the stream. So don't be shy. And if you recently joined, hi and welcome. Thanks for stopping by. I already talked about my new album, Old Friends, which is out everywhere now. Uh, you can go to fanlink.to slash old friends. The link is in the description of the video to get it anywhere that you get music. And my GarageBand audio mixing tutorial is now available. If you're a classical musician who records yourself and you have no clue how to make it actually sound good and you're a beginner, my tutorial will teach you everything you need to know. It's super easy. That's on my website, emilyplacecello.com slash tutorials. Um, okay. Let's play some more Bach and throw your questions. And I'm taking questions on anything, guys. Like, I mean, you know, keep it PG-13, please. But ask me whatever you want to ask. Um, because, again, I do this because I get so many questions in DMs, comments, and I can't always get to all of them. So please feel free to ask whatever you want to ask. It can be general, specific, whatever. And let's play some more Bach in the meantime. head cut off? No, I'm good. All right, I'm playing the second half of the Allemand from Bach's first cello suite. I played the first half before. And sorry, guys, like I told you, I didn't warm up for this stream. I didn't do anything. So these are like little kind of, I didn't need to do that. Sorry. These are raw performances. So that's my disclaimer. Thank you. 
second half of the almond. Oh yeah, I gotta put this, I'm so used to putting my cello on the floor. I'm trying to put it here so it's kind of in the shot. Okay. Alrighty. Okay, I'm gonna drink some water. Even though we're almost done, I could probably survive like another second without water, but you know. I forgot, let me get the cello in there. There we go. Okay. What are your tips for getting over the comparison trap and insecurities about your playing? Ugh, what a topic, what a topic. It's a big one and it's a great question. So, especially when you're in music school or you're in a competitive environment, you know, you're auditioning against your peers, you're getting ranked, you know, maybe you're in like a master class situation and everybody has to play. It's so hard to not compare yourself to other people um, and you're playing to other people. But what I will say, and I think this is especially important in classical music, there's such a focus on technique in classical music and like who's the best and like who's playing the hardest repertoire and who's playing the most in tune and who's playing the blah, blah, blah. But I'm just going to say right now with absolute certainty that playing the best is not what is touching people with classical music. And this is, I'm going to philosophize a little bit here and I promise I'm going to really answer your question, but I want to go off on this topic. Um, you know, I've talked very openly about how I started really late. Like, I don't know anyone else. I would love to think if I actually know anybody. Anyone else working professionally as a classical musician who started as late as I did. I don't know anybody else. Everyone I know has a stronger background than I do. Um, and then I got to college having started late. And then I, I had a... I didn't have a great relationship with my teacher. And I wasn't progressing the way I needed to. And then I had a really bumpy undergrad not making up for lost time. So anyway, I was like, and I, there's videos for whatever reason, these are the most popular videos on my channel where I talk about being the underdog, but, um, I was not the best technical player and I'm still not, you know, like that's, that's not the kind of player that I am. And I didn't have the background and the training to be set up to be that kind of player, but I've had a lot of really great things happen in my career. And a lot of them were just things that I did myself. And I believe that I was able to connect to people with my music because I was being myself and I was artistically expressing myself. And that is what truly connects to people is authentically expressing your art and your creativity. That is what's gonna touch people. Perfect technique is not gonna touch people. It might impress people. And yes, we need good technique because we need to win auditions. We need to, people to hire us. You know, we need to be good enough. I'm not saying technique doesn't matter. It absolutely matters, but a lot of times the comparison trap is that someone is technically has a leg up on you in one way or the other. And artistic expression is what is really, really at the core of what is going to make the most impact. So knowing that your unique musical voice and your artistic expression cannot be replicated by anybody else. That's like, that's your soul, you know, when you express yourself musically. And that can't be replicated or copied. And you don't want to replicate or copy someone else's expression. You know, you want to be... I like to think that when we choose to be musicians or artists of any kind, it's because we have a voice. We have something that we want to express. So that is what can't be copied and should never be compared because we each have a completely unique artistic expression and way that we share ourselves through our music. So I think when you find yourself getting, it's impossible to avoid. When you find yourself getting tangled in the thoughts of this person's better than me, this person's this than me, I'll never be as good as this person. Remember that the most important asset that you have is your unique expression. That's something that nobody can take away. And even if people try to copy it, they won't succeed because you can't copy that. So remind yourself that you have something to say musically. This is like what got me through my miserable years of being the worst and being bad and nobody thinking I was good was like, but I have something to say. Like I have something to say in my music. And even if people don't think I'm good, even if the teachers don't give me the time of day, even if whatever, I know that I have something to say. That's the most important thing that should keep you going. And that's at the end of the day, technique is simple practice and listen to your teacher and you will get better. It takes time, it takes putting in the effort, but there's nothing complicated about it. 
um, getting better at technique. But getting better artistically is a whole separate topic and being an artist is what really makes an impact. So work on your technique, get better in the ways that you need to get better by putting in the work, putting in the hours, putting in the discipline, but that's just not the whole picture. Know that you expressing yourself musically is what's really most important and that's what's unique to you. And don't lose sight of that. So many people lose sight of that in classical music and that goes back to the topic of you know, why do people go to music school and get a music degree or an advanced music degree, like a master's, and then they don't do music when they're done because they lost touch with their artistic voice. They got so caught up in technique and then maybe they never had an artistic voice. Maybe they realized, oh, I just did this because I was good at it. And now I realize that like, I don't really have anything to say or this doesn't inspire me. So never lose that and don't let comparing your technique or your abilities to someone else make you quiet your own musical voice because that's what matters. The technique, it takes time, but you'll always get better as long as you're working. You know, don't lose the artistic aspect. Um, can black people do rock music? Of course. <laughs> what kind of question is that? Yeah, of course they can. Um, Okay, guys, so I do want to wrap this in a few minutes. Um, so get your final questions in. I know I didn't do very much playing. Maybe I could play one more thing. But I just honestly don't have a ton to play for you guys today. Though I did say I was going to, but I'm like not dying to play something. But why don't I see if I can find a little short something to play uh, for the last round of questions. play this all the time. This Chiacona by Vitali. It's a 17th century ground bass piece. I have not played this in months, so I am just gonna play it down for you guys. We're gonna see what comes out. Um, but I love this piece. It's just like a feel-good, happy little, little tiny thing. Um, these 17th century pieces were not technically written for cello. They were written for bass instrument. Could have been a viola da gamba, a violone, uh, could be anything, but works nicely on cello. Um, so I'm going to play this little short piece. If you have any final questions, um, please throw them in there. I'm going to get to them after, after this little piece.
survived. Just barely. Alrighty, final questions. All right. Um, tips for preparing for college auditions. Practice playing for everybody you know. Make them listen to you. Your mom, your dad, your cousin, your brother, your friends. Like, once you have your audition repertoire that you can at least, like, play it through, just play it for as many people as possible because you're going to make mistakes and you want to make those mistakes in front of your friends and family instead of in the audition. So make those mistakes. Get used to... Um, it's auditions and everything. It's about the pressure of the moment. And that's a hard thing to simulate when you're always practicing by yourself. You don't feel any pressure when you're alone. So you have to get yourself into some pressurized situations just so that you can practice with how you deal with when something goes wrong or you mess up. Because the whole idea is like you mess up a note or you miss a shift or something and then your brain gets derailed because you're thinking about the mistake. So you have to practice getting your brain back on track to what you're doing in the moment. And the only way to do that is if you have the pressure of people looking at you while you're doing it. So practice performing for other people as much as you can. Um, Listen to your repertoire a lot. Find your favorite performer and listen to their recording. And I'm not saying to copy their musical interpretation, just so that the piece feels super ingrained. Like a lot of the, um, you know, you're probably playing concertos and stuff like that that have big accompaniments ideally. So to get used to what the accompaniment sounds like and how your solo part fits in with the accompaniment is really valuable. So when you're burnt out from practicing and you can't possibly put another hour on your instrument, Put a recording on and read your music along while you're listening to the recording and it actually still works your brain in the right way. Like while reading the notes, your brain is still sending the messages to your hands. So you're actually practicing without practicing. It's not a replacement for practicing, but when you're burnt out on actual practicing, listening to the piece and reading along with the sheet music is super valuable. Um, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions non-musicians have about music and musicians? This is a hard question for me to ask because I barely know non-musicians, if you can believe that. Everyone I know is a musician of some kind. If they're not a musician, they're an artist. Um, so it's hard to think about misconceptions of musicians. Oh, okay, I, I got one. That our life is like really fun all the time, <laughs> which I guess is not like totally untrue. But whenever I'm like at a social gathering or something and I like tell people what I do for a living, People are always like, wow, you're so lucky. That's amazing. You get to do what you love every day. And like, that is true to an extent, but there's a price of that. Like, I don't make very much money because I don't have a regular job. I don't have benefits that come with my job. I don't have paid time off. Like, there's a lot of things that come along with getting to do what you love every day. So I think that there's a misconception that musicians are just like, live in this amazing wonderful life because they get to play music every day which is amazing and wonderful but there's just cost to that you know there are separate challenges um so i think the life is a little harder than non-musicians maybe think it is oh and sorry i'm gonna get louder i forgot to turn myself up after the cello so now i'm probably louder i was probably quiet before anyway um Ever play with historical performance ensemble like Juilliard 415 or Ars Florissants? I don't, um, yeah, I mean, I, I went to uh, music school for my master's and played in Baroque ensembles all of there. Before I was doing my master's, I did a bunch of Baroque workshops. The Oberlin Baroque Performance Institute was the first one I did. I did that for two separate years. Amazing, fun program. So I, of course, played in ensembles and orchestras there. I did the International Baroque Institute at Longy, which is the school I ended up going to for my master's in Boston. Um, so I did that summer workshop. I did the Amherst Baroque Academy in Massachusetts um, and also their winter workshop in Philadelphia. So I did those. And then I did the American Box Soloist Academy in San Francisco. These were all American Box Soloist I did once I was in my master's program, but those I did before my master's. There was also a Baroque ensemble at the Hart School where I did my undergrad. Um, and then I played with the Harvard Baroque Orchestra for the whole time I was living in Boston, which is a really, really cool ensemble um, because Harvard is just an amazing place with a lot of culture and a lot of resources. So it was a very cool Baroque orchestra with a lot of really great opportunities. We had some really amazing guests come in and do concertos and got to play in beautiful churches and stuff. Um, 
So, yes, I've played with many, many a Baroque ensemble. Those are pretty much the only ensembles I've played in. Um, I want to ask a question, but I can't think of a good one. Can't help you there. Uh, any tips for recording? Have you ever recorded playing with a timing tick or recorded separate parts individually? So earlier in the stream, I was talking about my two-part videos that I do. Um, I never do a click track uh, just because classical music is not meant to be played metronomically. So I never record anything classical to a click track. When I do two-part recordings, and I mentioned this earlier in the stream, I record the harder part first, which is usually the solo part. Then I put the file on my phone and put an earbud in so that I can hear it. And I play along the second part, hearing the timing of the first part. Um, some people actually do it so they can see the file, but I, I can do it by ear. So, and I think most musicians, classically trained especially, could do it by ear. Um, so I just play along by ear to the part that I already recorded. And then once I put it in, the timing is already good. Um, yeah, I was in Boston for seven years. That's where I did my master's and then where I stayed and freelanced for five years after. And I formed a period instrument string quartet, emergence quartet. We were together for three years while I was there. And we did a bunch of stuff in Boston, also in New York. Um, so yeah, there's tons of early music in Boston. Um, and a lot of people wondered why I was leaving Boston as a Baroque cellist, but I had just had my fill of Boston <laughs> and of the East Coast. And I, even though there is not as much early music here in Los Angeles, I am just happier here. <laughs> so it's, it, it worked out for me. And I still, you know, I can do YouTube anywhere I go. I can record albums anywhere I go. So it doesn't matter what city I'm living in to do my own projects. Okay guys, I think I'm gonna wrap the stream. Thank you so much for stopping by, coming with your questions. I guess for the wrap up, give the video a thumbs up if you liked the stream. Um, and in case you missed it, I'll remind you all of my highlights of what's going on. My album, Old Friends, which is a, it's a sorry about the shrink wrap, makes it really reflective. Um, this is my album with my violinist friend, Laura. It's three Baroque violin sonatas on period instruments, Handel, Vivaldi, and Corelli. It's the bomb. I'm so proud of this album. And Laura, my violinist friend, is my favorite violinist, guys. She sounds so good. What I love about her playing is that she is super expressive and gets a gorgeous sound, but she's not afraid to go there and get, like, ugly and expressive. And that, to me, especially playing on gut strings, that's what it's all about. Everything doesn't have to be this, like, shiny, polished, beautiful sound. Like, we can get raw sounds in music, and that can be more expressive than anything. And Laura is great at sounding beautiful and sounding raw. She can really do it all. Um, so definitely check out the album. Um, it's everywhere online. Um, the link is in my description. You can just search Old Friends Baroque or search Emily Davidson in iTunes, Spotify, wherever. Or if you want a little handy link in the description, it'll take you to all the different places you can get it. It's also on my YouTube channel if you want to just listen to it on YouTube. Sorry, I'm like holding this very awkwardly. So Old Friends is out. Definitely grab a copy if you haven't. And then my GarageBand tutorial all about mixing your own audio that you recorded yourself, even if you recorded it on your phone or just like a crappy little whatever thing you have. Um, I show people who have never done any kind of audio anything how to use GarageBand to get your kind of ghetto recording to sound really, really nice because I've been doing that in GarageBand for years. Um, I now record on something, you know, halfway decent, but I still mix it all in GarageBand. So uh, if you record yourself and you want to know how to make your recording sound good by like adding reverb and compression and stuff like that, um, definitely check out my tutorial. It is $12, but it's 40 minutes long. It's going to have so much info that you will use forever. Like you will continue to mix your audio using all those tips. So that is on my website, emilyplacecello.com slash tutorials, or just go to emilyplacecello.com and click on tutorials. So that's there. I'm really excited about that video too. Those are my two big things. Um, and then of course I do have my YouTube channel open to collaborators because I'm trying to expand to include more early and Baroque music that isn't just me playing my cello because there's hundreds of videos of me playing my cello. Um, so if you play a period instrument um, and you play Baroque, I would even be down for some Renaissance or medieval if, you're one, if you actually are one of those people that you know, plays the VL or plays some more obscure instrument. I'm down for anything early music. Um, so there is a link on my website to apply to be a collaborator on the channel and have your video featured. So it can be a video you just film yourself. I can help you make it a little better quality and can go up on the channel and you can get featured. So 
emilyplaystello.com slash collaborators, or again, just go to my website, click on collaborators to apply. Um, so thanks for tuning in, guys. You know, I like to do these Q&A streams like maybe once a month on YouTube. Um, I usually announce them on my socials, so make sure you're following me at Emily Plays Cello everywhere. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And yeah, thanks again, guys. I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday. It's dinner time here on the West Coast, so I'm going to probably start thinking about making some food. Um, thanks again, you guys, and I will see you on the next stream, I'm sure. Bye.